Ever wondered what it's like to ditch the 9 to 5 grind and live life like it's one big adventure? That's the essence of digital nomadism. So picture this. Your office could be a beach in Bali one day and a cozy cafe in Paris the next. It's not just about remote work, it's about embracing a lifestyle where your laptop is your ticket to the world. No bosses peering over your shoulder, just you and your dreams and a world full of endless possibilities. Digital nomadism? It's like working from your dream destination and calling it just another Tuesday. Pretty cool, right? Welcome to All Things Millennial. I'm your host Sujil and each week I'll engage in topics that hold significant meaning for the most of us or just simply tell more about the unique perspectives of the fellow millennials. Today's episode covers everything about the digital nomadic lifestyle, finding affordable places to stay, adapting to new cultures and languages and much more. Our special guest today is someone who ditched the U.S. back in 2017 with one-way ticket and has been living the global life ever since. Tired of the 9-to-5 grind, she jumped into the online work scene, figuring out how to make the dream lifestyle happen. As a writer for big names like HubSpot and GoDaddy, she is not just sipping cocktails on the beach, she is building a legit online business. Now, she and her husband are like modern-day nomads, cruising around the globe. And guess what? She's putting all her digital nomad wisdom into a book, which is dropping in January 2024. So get ready to hear the whole story and pick up some tips. So join me in welcoming Kayla Arik. Um, hi, Kayla. Thank you so much for joining us today. I was briefly mentioning about your digital nomad lifestyle in the intro. So can you please introduce yourself a little bit, share a bit about your journey as a digital nomad and what actually got you into that? Yeah, so I became a digital nomad six years ago. I was I'm originally from the U.S., but in 2017, I was living in Chicago and feeling like I really wanted to travel and it, feeling like if I don't do it now, when is there going to be time? I was kind of like imagining that like if my career was like a, a graph, it was only going to get harder and more demanding, you know, like I was still in the entry kind of level phase of my career and assuming that I would have a house or pets or family someday, I thought, man, if I can't make time now, it's never going to happen. So I learned about people who were actually like living out of vans. Like I lived, learned about van life in 2017 on Instagram. And that like blew my mind that people were living this alternative lifestyle. And that kind of like opened the door for me into learning about alternative lifestyles that revolved around travel. And once I learned about digital nomads, I was hooked on the idea that all you needed was a computer. And I just became obsessed. I watched travel documentaries, listened to podcasts, YouTube series. I was like consuming it. Every time I wasn't at work or sleeping, I think I was consuming information about traveling. And then I became uh, yeah, a digital nomad in August of 2017. And I've been living or traveling abroad. I still visit the U.S. Uh, every year, but I've been living and traveling abroad ever since now for six years. That is so fascinating. I mean, I have watched, binge watched uh, so many YouTube videos on van lives and it's always a concept that's so surreal for me, something I could never pursue. I don't know, like everybody thinks that, right? Yeah. Uh, that okay this is not something i could pursue you really need to have courage to give up on your timelines and your life as a person who's working nine to five doing everything else and then you suddenly wake up one day and okay i want to do that but i really appreciate you sharing your story and um that sounds amazing i mean <laughs> uh so i know uh what digital nomadism is as a lifestyle but what does it mean to you personally i always think about digital nomadism just as an opportunity so there's like you can get in the in the weeds about definitions like only people who travel full-time or digital nomads or only people who you know don't have a home base or whatever and to me it's so unimportant like the the like splitting hairs about that definition to me it's just that you 
I think the only thing that we all have in common is being online. We all work online or I'm, I've even met digital nomads who work partially online and partially in person. People who are event planners where they'll, where they'll plan an event for six months and then go and be on the ground while the event is happening. Honestly, I think that it's just a love of travel and pursuits or even freedom, you know, if you want to really zoom out. I think travel's like the small, that's the micro, but like the macro view of digital nomadism is opportunity and how many opportunities you get to spend your time differently. And that to me is what it's really all about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I always uh, say this and I really mean this, like, Whenever you get a chance to travel, just take it, even if it's for a day, even if it's for a few weeks, like make time for travel because someday you will have the time and money, but you won't have the energy to travel. And it's like a dream for, I think, almost everyone to travel the world, right? So what are some countries or places that you have lived as a digital nomad? I have lived, I lived, lived in the Netherlands for five years. I'm actually back there right now. Um, I actually immigrated and became a citizen earlier this year. So I, um, that's the only place I've like established residency, but I've traveled through uh, quite a few countries, probably a couple dozen countries traveled through and worked a lot in a lot of them. Um, I just spent some time in Mexico and, um, yeah, just drifting around Europe a lot. Uh, during the pandemic, that was, you know, the easiest. We did some hiking in Europe, trying to be outdoors. So that was kind of a fuzzy period where, you know, travel was a bit strange. Okay, that sounds amazing. Uh, so how does a typical day in your life look like? Or what is your work schedule uh, when you're working digitally? I don't travel as much as... Um, like say like backpackers people are kind of taking like a gap year or something so I'm not moving all the time where um, if you're taking like six months off and you saved up money and you're going to travel you're probably like moving every two or three days and I tried to move every month so my month to month actually looks really similar to other people where uh, I get up around seven or eight. I work for most of the day and I put work away around three, go to the grocery store, get food, walk around, you know, spend time outside and then cook dinner. And sometimes I work for an hour or two, depending on how early I have my day short. But it's pretty boring, I think, to most people. They think it's like you're in museums, you're hiking, you're watching the sun sunrise. Every I do love to watch the sunrise. That's one of my favorite things. <laughs> but it's not like a travel like day to day is not traveling you're just working somewhere else and it's actually really like slow and peaceful and calm and maybe a lot less adrenaline you know like than people think it is they think it's very like high adventure and i think if people spent the day with me they would be surprised at how relaxed it is yeah i mean definitely not boring i mean i would do anything to have that as my uh, my routine day so it sounds very exciting. I mean, I would love to join you one day. <laughs> yeah, we are on an adventurous day. But yes, I mean, when you are choosing your next destination, you said you are constantly on. So if you're choosing your next destination, what are some of the factors that you really look into uh, while deciding on your next destination? I look at contrast more than anything. So if I was just somewhere cold, I would like to go somewhere warm. Um, if I was somewhere kind of secluded, I, you know, I think contrast is your best friend. If you have the option, if you're constantly changing your environment, then you need it to be stimulating. And um, like, I don't think if you're, if you work in New York City, I don't think that you can have this like eye-opening experience I mean, maybe, you know, going to like London, you know, and yes, you could have like a fantastic time. But if you're looking for something like very different, I think that people need to look at contrast. So weather, like climate and also environment, like some cities, for example, or just have like a different energy. They're like super bustling and loud and busy and uh, looking for something quiet, quieter cities or going more remote, you know, going somewhere more secluded or focusing on nature altogether which comes with challenges because you need high speed internet still and mm -hmm. um, like really remote places don't always have that. But um, yeah, that's, that's my advice for anyone. Look for a, just a change from what you have currently. Yeah. I mean, I'm listening uh, to you discussing 
while I'm shivering and cold here. <laughs> but you said, you ah, uh, yeah. I mean, one of my closest friends, she's in Netherlands. She's been there for a few years now, like a little more than five years, and she speaks so highly of that place. So I'm definitely planning to visit her later next year. Like awesome, you should next year. Yeah, I'm sure it's beautiful. You'll have a good time. I have come watch that spring. day. Yeah, they are a lot into biking oh, yeah. and just trailing, walking. Things yeah, like that. yeah. Dutch people like to spend time outside. It's a very nice quality. Americans are a little bit like busier. Like on a nice Tuesday afternoon, Dutch like the Dutch cities in a Dutch street are like filled people in oh. on the terrace, sipping coffee, taking the afternoon to be outside, and it's really it's really nice. People enjoy themselves like they enjoy the they enjoy life here i think you can kind of feel it yeah I, I mean especially in north america i don't know i'm just talking for myself but i see a lot of weekend activities people kind of live through weekends uh mm -hmm. four to the weekend and then five days it's like crickets <laughs> but springs are better i must say uh I love Canadian springs and summers. They're the best, especially sunsets and that mm. mean thing. But oh. uh, yeah, like let's uh, jump back to the next question. Can you tell us about your profession or career as a digital nomad? I know you briefly mentioned about publishing a book later next year, if I'm not wrong. So tell us more about that. I started freelance writing to be a digital nomad. So I already had some experience writing and I found a position where I could freelance write. And um, it was like Monday to Friday and I would wake up and write four articles, usually by noon, and then I would be done with my work for the day. So that was not the best position for me. It was uh, I didn't love the topic, like the writing. It was difficult, but I took any job I could to get started. Just wanting to get my foot in the door. And then from there, I found my own clients because I had a little bit of understanding. I was used to invoicing and sticking to a writing schedule. So from there, I tried quite a few different freelance skills. Like I also freelanced graphic design for a while and I did Pinterest management for a while, which is kind of like social media management mm -hmm. but for Pinterest. And uh, I've dabbled in quite a few different things, which is the nice thing if you're willing or, you know, if you want to go freelance to be a digital nomad, you can just get one client to try something. You don't have to change your whole job. It could be something that you do one day a week and just try it out, which is really cool. But now I focus on writing and content marketing. So I am a freelance writer for HubSpot and GoDaddy. And um, I did just write a book that's coming out in January, which is called How to Be a Digital Nomad. So um, that was a super exciting opportunity that I didn't expect. Uh, a publisher reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to write this book. And I always thought about writing a book. So I said yes. And it was just so fun to like really examine the movements and realize like how big this thing is. It's not about it's not recent. Like the first digital nomad was in the 80s. So uh, this movement is like so much bigger than I think most people realize. And it was really nice for me to experience that kind of like realization. Especially post the pandemic era, people started working remotely and then they got an urge to, you know, move all together. I mean, I really appreciate that people are getting uh, these chances and opportunities to do something like this it's really exciting and i'm also excited for you uh for the book launch i'll definitely check it out and i'll also link it in the description of this episode if anybody else wants to check it out so good luck for that <laughs> yeah i mean like thinking about constantly on being on the move i personally speaking for myself i would constantly be thinking about things i could do and not work. <laughs> mm. So if I am at a certain place, I would constantly uh, Google the itineraries to do that day. So how do you manage work while being remote or at a new place and still be very productive at your uh, job? Most people have a very hard time with it at first, and it's really normal. Like one of my friends just became, started traveling uh, in the last year, and she said, I don't think I'm good at this. I'm so distracted. I can't bring myself to work. And I told her, oh, no, you're there. <laughs> That's what everyone goes through. Because, yeah, if you're not used to traveling as well, all of a sudden you're thrown in. You're like, like, let's say you just like 
or you're in Paris and you think, I'm only going to be here once in my life, maybe. And you have this like constant FOMO, that fear of missing out. And it's something that you really have to learn to deal with. And you just learn as you go. But for me, I, um, I had to learn that I'm not like I'm working first. Like I wake up and I do my work and then I can go out for the day. And that's whenever I'm traveling. Like I'm not working and traveling my whole day to me. It's like half of it's work and half of it's or the later, you know, the latter half is experiencing where I'm at. And it helps that you can pick where you work. Like I always encourage people don't book something that's like cheap in a suburb to save some money if you can, because you're not going to really have time. Like, let's say you quit working at five and then you're going to take the train or the bus into the city. You know, you're not going to be experiencing that as much as you expect if you have to travel. You really need to be able to close the lid of your laptop, walk out your door and be experiencing something. And that helps keep you kind of within the lines of still being a good worker because um, it doesn't come naturally to anybody. Like, I don't think there's a single person that that balance has come naturally to. Yeah, I I mean, maintaining discipline in something like this is difficult. Like in anything in life, uh, you need to have that discipline and a mindset that, okay, you are here for something else first. You're going to work most of your day, then go for travel. I mean, yeah, I appreciate your tip. It's really helpful for anybody else who's thinking to do something like this. Even for me, last year, I went to my home country, India, for three months. Oh, which is a long time to be there and not working. So I decided to work remote. I was like, okay, I'm going to work a few weeks uh, from India before my, like, at the start of my vacation and then at the end of my vacation. And let me tell you, that was the worst time. Oh, really? Yeah, I had such a hard time focusing, especially with the time difference. And then you are in that vacation mindset. You're surrounded by people and family. So... It was definitely hard for me. Maybe uh, you are not able to relate since uh, you have been doing this for years. But Oh, I, I can relate. I think family is harder to work around. Yeah, like, I... <laughs> there's nothing because they don't necessarily see you as working. And even if they do, it's, I don't know, I, I stay with my parents whenever I go back to the States and there's nothing harder for me to work around. And I, it's because I also just want to be with them. Like I would rather be, my parents are nurses, so sometimes they are working night shift and they're home during the day. Like I want to be sitting at the kitchen table chatting, you know, that time is really precious. Like to me, the FOMO of family time is so much more intense than the FOMO of like, I don't know, being out on the town in, you know, Milan or something. It's really difficult. I still haven't figured it out. (laughs) I mean, that concept that if you have a laptop you at home, you probably don't need to work and just be online. So that concept is kind of, uh, it was hard for me to uh, really do that out there. But yeah, I appreciate that tip from you. And I know you kind kind of touched base on this topic but what are your preferred types of accommodation when you're traveling as a digital nomad i really like airbnbs and you know i'm married so my husband and i are together so i have that contact i don't think airbnbs are right for everyone because um if you are solo traveling which i was in the beginning as a digital nomad you can get so lonely where you might not be like talking out loud to anyone like in real life except the person who you're like you know the, the cashier at the grocery store and that can be damaging for your mental health so it doesn't work for everyone but now that I uh yeah I, I like the control of an Airbnb I used to live in hostels whenever I first started as a digital nomad and I would sit at like the hostel kitchen table surrounded by people coming and going all day and I liked the buzz but now I guess I'm a bit more sensitive because I've become a lot more focused but that also means that I'm sensitive. Like, I don't want people to be walking behind my computer screen all day. That's that. And, and back in the day, that didn't distract me because I liked it all. But now I feel very distracted by that and I can't get into my work. So my needs have changed a lot in the last six years. And I think that you can kind of examine where you're at at any given moment. Like, do you need stimulation? Go to maybe a hostel or a co-working space or a cafe. Cafes are tricky, though, because the Wi-Fi is really unreliable. Like, even if a cafe has great Wi-Fi one day, the w- signal may be really weak the next day. So I don't think that's like a very 
like strong plan for day to day working. And then an Airbnb is kind of at the other end of that. So those are like the kind of the options that I think people can explore. When traveling alone, it can be very fascinating at first. Uh, I always wanted to do that. I had it on my bucket list to be solo traveling somewhere. I, I think it's on everybody's bucket list, but not uh, everyone finds the courage to do that when the time comes. So, yeah, I think these are some great tips, especially in this era of uh, internet and when you... And uh, when you can work digitally, I think it's a great opportunity to in for anyone who is trying to or even thinking about pursuing something like this. So what are some uh, ways to find and book affordable places or comfortable places while you are staying at a different location each time? On Airbnb, you can get a big discount if you stay for a month in one accommodation. I don't know if everybody knows that, but if you stay for a month, there's almost always a discount. And I've seen it be more than 50% off. Like I found the best stuff I ever found was an apartment in Lisbon that was originally $2,500 and the month long discount, I think it was $590. It was like almost $25. It would percent of the original cost. And I always, we every time we stay for a month, we get big discounts. It's usually about 50%, I would say. So, uh, and then you also save money that way more because you're not traveling. Like if you were traveling to a different country every week, you would spend so much on like tourist taxes and flights and then the taxi to the Airbnb and the Airbnb. So whenever you slow down, you automatically save more money. And that's just one way that you do that is getting these discounts. But I always look for a separate workspace. I really like somewhere with like a desk or a kitchen table. Um, working from bed is not cute long term. It's actually not very good for your computer either. You really need your your laptop needs to be on a hard surface or you like claw. Well, you know, they plug up the vent space and that causes parts of your computer to potentially overheat and melt. I melted part of my computer. Um, my last computer, I melted part of it. Um, so this I'm speaking from experience here. Um, yeah, so a separate work, workspace is really important for me. And you just learn what's important to you as you travel. Uh, a kitchen is like a nice kitchen. Uh, like a nice is the wrong word, but a ki- like a real kitchen is really important to me. Like there needs to be a stove and not like one hot plate. I stared at, stayed in a and b in Cancun for one night a few weeks ago and it literally had like a hot plate that plugged into the wall, but there wasn't, there weren't pots or pans they just put it there so they could check the box that they had a like exactly. quotes kitchen, and I I look critically at the kitchen and the workspace before I book, and always asking about the internet speed. That's very important. Let me tell you, I spend a significant amount of time uh, working from my bed, which I won't be doing anymore. But yeah, I uh, I agree. Like kitchen, especially when you are. Uh, going there for a long time, it's really important to, for the kitchen to be there, cooking your own meals, having control over what you're putting in your body. And if I were to travel for that long, I would do that too. And talking about your tip about booking an Airbnb for a month long and getting discounts, I did not know that. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Yeah, and play around with the dates because sometimes it's actually cheaper to book it for longer. Like if you only want to stay for three weeks, still check how long, like check how much it costs to book for a month because sometimes you automatically trigger this huge discount where it can co- you can save you money to book it for longer. It's all these algorithms and uh, I check a lot of the dates, like the week or 10 days that we want to check out of an Airbnb, I check every single day. And the price changes every day. And sometimes it goes down. Like I just found this yesterday at a listing we were looking at where if I, if you, if we stay two days longer, it went down like $300, the whole listing price. And that was to stay longer. You're, it's very, yeah. <laughs> it's all the algorithms, but play around with it and you will be shocked, I think, at the discounts you find. Yeah, that's a great tip. So share with us some memorable moments or challenges you have had while traveling. Uh, I'm sure you have many stories to share, but share the best one. Oh, um, I feel like things breaking is always inevitable whenever you're on the road long term, like um, or losing things. Whenever I was in um, 
Columbia in 2017, I lost my computer charger, which is like, what's the point? A computer doesn't do anything. It's just like a heavy piece of plastic without a charger. So all of a sudden I couldn't work and uh, we were totally panicked. I was going around to all the computer stores in Mm. Bogota uh, asking, like I was carrying my computer and I would say like, do you have the charger? And they all said, no, sorry, no, we don't have it. And I was starting to panic. And um, this guy, I'm like walking around this kind of mall area holding my laptop thinking like, like I like feel like the blood draining from my face. Like I'm going to lose this client. I'm going to lose my income. I don't know what I'm going to do. And this guy walked up and he said, you need to put your computer away or someone's going to rob you. I thought, oh my gosh, I'm literally like so wrapped up in my own head that I'm he even like did like a punching motion with his hand. He like, because he could see that I didn't speak a lot of Spanish where he kind of like show is like did like the eyes motion of seeing my computer and punching. And he said like, Pegar, which means like to punch, like someone's going to come take your computer. I thought, well, I can't find a charger. And now I'm like, you know, so wrapped up in my own business that I'm not even being safe anymore. I'm like walking around with my laptop out in an area where it's not safe to do that. And I eventually did find a computer charger, but uh, I don't know what I would have done if I didn't. I mean, you can't just get things delivered everywhere. In the U.S. and Canada, I think you're very, we're, we're very spoiled there that you can get anything delivered in two days. And that is not the case in all countries. Like some countries, the mail just takes a lot longer. Or um, or if you're moving, you know, if you have a flight on Tuesday, you can't wait for a package. And you might have to pay money to receive it. Whenever I've had some things shipped to the Netherlands, I've had to pay a lot of money like in import tariffs like you it's just getting things ordered by mail is not a guarantee whenever you're traveling so uh, whenever you have problems or you lose things or they break it becomes like emergency response now how do i fix this and it's not always easy to fix things not everybody or every place on the earth lives in this amazon prime era when the success is hard (laughs) <laughs> like especially for me now I'm so used to Amazon or anywhere like you're just guaranteed that delivery but uh, thanks for sharing that story it's such a fun yet I mean thinking about it in retrospect it can be a bit scary too <laughs> but uh, hopefully everything worked out uh, over there and talking about some uh, tech essentials what are some tech tools or apps do you rely on to maintain your life going while working digitally or being remote um for me google drive i would not be able to live without i back up my computer every day it backs up automatically to google drive all my files and i I think everyone should do that if you're going to travel full time it can be dropbox or i have yet to meet a single person who says they use their external hard drive Uh, I actually surveyed my LinkedIn network about this when I was writing the book because everyone always says, oh, you have to pack an external hard drive if you're going to be a digital nomad. And I said, who uses their external hard drive every day to back up their computer? And no one, even people were saying, well, I do it whenever I transfer a lot of photos or I do it on this day or deadline, but no one does it every day that I could find. So I recommend having, you know, don't don't rely on your own memory. Uh, Get something for your computer that does it automatically. And uh, for me, it's Google Drive. That's the best investment. And I also use Zoom a lot. And then just for my business, because as a writer, I'm self-employed. So I use Canva and Zoom and these kind of just like trips of the trade there. Then my website is all hosted. I use a lot of platforms to run my website. But a reliable laptop is the best investment you can make. And getting one that's repairable. So not all computers are easily repaired. So that's kind of something to look at if you're buying a new computer. Like people always say that Macs are the best investment (laughs) for a travel laptop. And if you have never had a problem with your MacBook, then that's great. And they're great computers that used to have a MacBook Pro, but uh, they can't always be, they can't be repaired by just anybody. I I think uh, this was somebody actually interviewed a uh, computer repairman in my book to give his tips. (laughs) How do you take care of your computer traveling? And he said that, he said he, his understanding was that Mac can oh no, they can only be repaired by like official Apple retailers. And if you're like on an island on the Mediterranean or somewhere anywhere where Macs, I mean, Macs are synonymous with wealth, I think like Apple in general is a brand as you travel. Uh, so 
I don't know. To me, that's where I was happy to get a Lenovo computer, something more that's much. I could, re- if I knew how to use a computer, how to do it, I could repair it myself. You know, you can just crack it open and replace the parts. So repairability is a big priority there. And thinking about safety. Those were the days where you could just um, remove a battery from from your computer and then reinsert it, and everything started working again. <laughs> not anymore. But do you have any external internet sources if you are not uh, able to rely on a inter- on the internet at a cafe or at the library and externally? I do not have any. Uh, I know a lot of people who have tried those little like internet Mm -hmm. kind of portable devices, the Wi-Fi, and I've never heard anyone who uh, said it was kind of, I don't know, I've heard a lot of stories where it's a nice idea, but it doesn't translate. Like they don't have, like the the signal's very weak. Like, yeah, it has internet, but it's just as weak as the cafe. And um, they're nice, but to me, it was never kind of worth that ongoing cost. I try to reduce my ongoing costs, and I would rather pay a little bit more for an Airbnb that has verified fast Wi-Fi. And if you check your Airbnb or your hostel or your hotel, if you ask them to check the internet speed before you book, you can avoid a lot of those issues. Yeah. And I'm sure, like, not just tech-wise, but everything else in general can be challenging too so how do you usually adapt to new cultures or languages especially and even environment i know you just mentioned that it's getting chilly out there and you just came to netherlands from mexico which can be again a different environment altogether so how do you adapt to all those changes i try to take a few days off during transition periods because it is overwhelming uh leaving mexico after being there for 10 weeks you know i'm thinking all the things i want to eat and do and see and people i met i made friends we made friends while we were there we wanted to see friends one last time uh i think it's too much to kind of try to do all those like travel experiences alongside your work on all of those days so i recommend everyone takes time off whenever you're leaving somewhere and whenever you're arriving somewhere taking a few days off that allows you to just be in the moment like you don't want to be checking your email or sending files from the airport wi-fi that that wi-fi is never that good and it's just so stressful to be like sitting there thinking oh i need to reply to my boss or this client you're not in the moment anymore if you're trying to work on travel days i think because travel days are supposed to they're meant to be like busy and bored at the same time like the bus is late or the flight's delayed and you're playing cards or reading a book or people watching you really need to make time for that to still happen i think and that's how i kind of keep myself from feeling overwhelmed because i'm always uh trying to like process all the emotions of changing and landing somewhere new and like the first time you go to a grocery store in a new country is so intimidating you like don't know what anything is where it is what to do uh i'll never forget being in spain and i picked up an apple and i was like squeezing it because i wanted to make sure it wasn't you know like bruised and this guy came running over waving his arms yelling at me and i guess i wasn't supposed to do that (laughs) and you think oh gosh yeah it's not appropriate it's not appropriate every country to like squeeze the fruit and vegetables uh but i forgot to you know it's just you're like in, ex- experiencing so much and you can't you shouldn't be there looking at the grocery store stuff for the first time and also thinking about your to-do list and your inbox you have to be in the moment of the travel experiences or you're gonna like lose the love for it because it's a lot of work to be traveling full-time you're like always like okay wh- where am i going where's the grocery store is that the cheap one is it safe to walk out at night you're like constantly processing so much and you need to love it or it's not worth it very quickly i think once you get burnt out on that yeah it's it's always about the little things it's not the things you have planned, but the things you experience firsthand when you are there, I think that makes up for the experience. And it's very different to just read about or listen to podcasts about digital nomadism. It sounds fascinating. And from what I've heard, it's the future. So many people are opting for it, uh, especially people who are just approaching their mid to 20s are definitely doing it to uh, find themselves. So uh, I see a very positive uh, 
a rainbow future for digital nomadism but since you are experiencing it or doing it yourself what do you where do you see it going i think that it's it's very much here to stay there you there was a lot of skepticism about that even in 2017 whenever i became a digital nomad people were like that's a phase you can't have a real career all online and you know then you look and you realize that people have been doing it since the 80s uh it's very much here to stay but it's not for everyone. And I think a lot of people are going to try the lifestyle and realize that it's not for them long term. And part of that is because they were necessarily sold on a realistic image of the lifestyle. And a lot of people online are sharing what it's like to be a digital nomad, but they haven't themselves moved past the first impressions of it. Because until you've like had your first serious health issue where you've been in the hospital, or you've missed a funeral back home, or you've lost your job and you have to handle that. Um, you ha- you're still maybe living in the honeymoon phase, which is a great thing because it means that you're having a good time and a good experience. But um, I think that it, the longer you go, the more you realize that it's not like the answer to everything. You know, the, you can't run away from any problems you have. Like at first, you can. You can like go to these beautiful places and meet friends maybe party there can be a lot of kind of partying in the travel sphere people are like li- you know living like there's no tomorrow in ways there's no monday to friday it's just yesterday today and tomorrow and uh you can run away from anything that you've been not dealing with for a while but all of that catches up with you so i think a lot of people will try it and have a good time for a while and most people will do it long term i mean i've even drifted in and out i've been working online for six years and i've been abroad for six years but um i had a home address for five years and i used that as a home base but i always came home to my apartment and now i don't have an apartment now i'm fully nomadic but I would never say like this is like the real way to do digital nomadism because there's no real way except to get what you need right now and use this opportunity and i hope that that's what people find that you know you can have a garden and or you know like settle down but if you're still working online you still i mean even if you aren't but that to me is the freedom like let's focus on the freedom of being able to work wherever you want not having to work from somewhere else yeah that's really fresh i mean i haven't uh, heard of anything like this especially any perspective like this because people just talk about the rainbows and bed of roses that they experience while doing something like this. And it entices so many people to go for it without uh, looking at the actual reality. Because everything in life can not always be good. It always comes with its downsides, right? So talking about you, do you see yourself doing this for years to come? Or is this... Uh, something for a short term or it was just for experience purposes i think i'll be abroad long term and i think that i'll work online long term but traveling being fully nomadic i'm not sure it's something that my husband barry and i talk about a lot because we've been we moved out of our apartment five months ago we've been fully nomadic and uh this is my second time being fully nomadic with no idea when or where i'll start stop traveling and i think that it could go on for a year it could go on for a decade um we are we talk about it a lot what we need right now and i think that that's all you can really do to decide like i actually read an article where um it was in cnn i think where somebody they interviewed a couple that was traveling as a digital nomad and they were on a seven year around the world trip and they were still in the first six months and i thought oh my gosh you have just no idea like we could have another global pandemic in the next seven years like Mm -hmm. you can never say where you're gonna go and we only plan a month or two at a time like i probably have like a few big things on the on the like horizon like in may we'll be back in the u.s to celebrate my parents birthdays you know i know that'll happen but i don't have another thing like we don't even know where we're gonna be three weeks from now or four weeks from now we're really just drifting around so I could never pretend to know what's in the future long term, but so far I can say it's going really well. And um, whenever one of us gets sick, we'll slow down. You know, I mean, 
whenever one of us gets sick of it, needs a break, uh, is homesick, you know, we got really, really bad food poisoning in Mexico and we were so homesick for food that we reckon we're familiar with. We actually talked about just like coming back to the Netherlands. We were, well, we weren't really getting better. We were like very sick. We were sick for about six weeks from food poisoning, which is pretty unusual. So, uh, yeah, it's hard to, pl- it's harder to plan than in normal life. It can definitely take a toll on your mental health too, apart from Mm -hmm. um, all the physical difficulties you might face. So yeah, since you took this uh, step, which is really courageous of you to do so, I must say, what are some uh, personal growths or perspectives that got changed in your life that you never expected would come for you? Oh, I guess the first thing that comes to mind is having to face all my worst qualities i think that that's not that's something nobody wants to do but it's something that whenever you work online like you're really forced to face all of your self-sabotage like any quirks that you have that sabotage your success you have to deal with because they come up over and over again it's like a like jack in the box that like screams in your face every day like stop procrastinating you're not being focused you're wasting your time uh you because you can kind of like ignore that in day-to-day life, especially if you're at the office, because there's a lot of downtime at the office. And uh, it's easy to kind of, I don't know, not necessarily notice your like quirks and your qualities that like how you work. As long as you get your work done, you maybe don't think that much about it. Whenever you're alone, you're forced to really examine it. And I've had to deal with my procrastination, my um like how I handle stress I've had to deal with that in a very like intense ways because it's like right in my face like I'm sabotaging my happiness every day by procrastinating and we all do that sometimes but whenever you do it every day for months and you see it in the mirror it really makes you yeah evaluate what you're doing and how you work and that's been the biggest one of the biggest growths for me was learning to actually be a good worker and stop ignoring my bad qualities. I mean, who doesn't like, who wants to sit down and really look at those things in themselves, but this experience forces you to do that. I mean, agree to disagree, but we have stepped into this uh, self-development era. Everybody wants to be a better version of themselves. It's the it girl era, I like to call it. (laughs) But yeah, I I know you have like people are becoming so much self-aware even at a younger age you see people in their early 20s they are trying to grow like personal development and they are trying to work on their health fitness mental health every in every aspect of uh, their lives so i see how it can be beneficial for you uh, since you are living this amazing digital uh, nomadic life so uh I'm I'm really happy for you that uh, something like that happened to you without even trying or, you know, uh, spending so much time actively thinking about it. So that's amazing. But uh, apart from just having the freedom to work from anywhere, are there any surprising benefits that you encountered that you did not expect uh, came from this lifestyle? Yeah, I've you know, been able to say yes to so many things that I would have otherwise had to say no to. Um, like a really easy example, uh, my best friend became, was a single mom giving birth to twins and I got to be there. I got to be her birth partner. Whereas like how would that conversation have gone at my nine to five? You know, like, well, my friend is due on this day. Um, can I uh, maybe have off? You know, I could have never said yes to that and really committed because I had no idea when she was going to go to labor or how long it would take. And I got to just show up and be there. And I stayed at the hospital with her and the babies for a few days after they were born. And um, I that was an experience I would have never had without being able to kind of have control over where I was working. And I've also spent a lot of quality time with my family, like going back to the U.S. for a month every year. Um, I have before, I mean, I didn't live where my family lived. I lived in Chicago. They lived in another part of the country. So I would go home for like a weekend here or there or a week at Christmas or something. But I wasn't spending like loads of time there because I was always going back to Chicago to work. So I actually, even though I'm farther away, I spend more time with my parents per year now than I used to, which is something that was really important to me. 
just being able to say yes whenever, you know, like my parents are both uh, turning 60 this next year. and I get to say, yeah, I'm definitely going to be there. You know, I'm definitely going to show up and we'll be there for like a month to visit. And uh, that control has been just such a blessing. I mean, you won't uh, realize how big of a blessing it is until you miss one of the events that you really wanted to be for. Like I live away from my family too. I know it's not the same. Uh, but yeah, I do live away uh, from my family and it's difficult when you're missing little things, you're missing festivals, you're missing birthdays and it won't ever be the same, right? So I'm glad you're able to do that for yourself and it's really exciting. So if anyone else is wanting to dive into this lifestyle or wanting to just know more about it, what resources, books, podcasts would you recommend or what you have uh, used in the past? I think a great resource is the Location Indie, I-N-D-I-E, Location Indie podcast and community. That's a paid community for people who are trying to be location independent to be able to work from anywhere. So their podcast is great and the community is, that they have like meetups every week is really wonderful. And um, I can, I mean, you could find so many YouTube channels and blogs online um, that cover any aspects. Like I would say if you're interested in a specific country, then uh, look for a blog that focuses on like remote work in that country or YouTubers who have gone there and uh, just consume as much as you can about that experience. And definitely if you're looking for kind of a complete guide, of course, I have to mention, you know, my book, How to Be a Digital Nomad, covers uh, very comprehensively the process of like how much money do you need and how do you go about it? And uh, that is, uh, yeah, the biggest resource I have put together on the topic. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's exciting. I mean, it would definitely be of great use for anyone who is... Uh even thinking about doing or diving into such a lifestyle. So lastly, I would love another tip from you. And that's uh, something very meaningful to me. If I would consider doing it, how would I build relationships, new relationships or keep up with the existing relationships in my life? To keep up with the existing relationships, I think it's really important to share average moments it's really easy to only send your family or friends a picture whenever you're like hiking Machu Picchu or doing a sunrise trek over the ocean uh but send a picture of your breakfast send a picture of you know and your walk to the grocery store something funny that you saw you know it doesn't have to be like I, I think it shouldn't all be postcard moments because um people feel like they can't relate to you anymore and it's also just not true it's just not the reality you know like it's not at your every day isn't those big moments and for making new friends I think it's really helpful to become active online in some circles so maybe it's on Facebook joining Facebook groups for digital nomads and meeting up with people locally or on LinkedIn um, I'm very active on LinkedIn and I've met a lot of people that way where we've developed you know very real friendships online and getting on Zoom and talking and uh that those are very can be really valuable and in person you can look for meetups there's i think there's an irish bar in every city in the world that i've been to and they often have like pub nights or you know, like quiz it like quiz uh like trivia nights or um like themed events if you go there to just try to you know be open and talking to people like you can go alone and meet people there and and hostels are also just whenever you're on the road, hostels are just a great place for fast friends and meeting new people. And uh, people are very open because a lot of people are all traveling alone there. So people are very open to that, open to yeah, becoming friends. I think even when you're not doing this full time, it can be a great tip, uh, especially sharing your average moments, as you mentioned. It can be a great thing to do just to stay connected with people who you are who you are not regularly in touch with. So I'm definitely going to do that for often. Oh, yeah. But yeah, it's amazing. Uh, thank you so much for sharing all these insightful things with us. But lastly, tell us, are you living the dream? I'm sure you get this question and what work. But people do talk about living the dream. So what is your take on that? Yeah, I've heard it many times, uh, the living the dream uh, remark. And I can honestly say I'm living my dream and my dream will change and then I'll move on to living that. You know, uh, 
I might crave a garden, you know, an herb garden and a cat someday and move on. I don't think, you know, kind of quotes the dream for not, like any of us. It's not a fixed point. But um, right now I can honestly say that, you know, I'm living exactly the way I want to. And that is something that I thought would never happen whenever I watched other people living, which is why I try so hard to encourage people. Like digital nomadism is for normal people. It's for like you already look like a digital nomad the way you are now. You're like, you are good enough. You don't need to be more worldly. You have more experience. You'll get all of it along the way. And um, then you could be living the dream too, if this is your dream. All you have to do is kind of get on that plane and go and find your online income. And you, like, I think most people are capable of doing that. It's not, uh, it's scary, but it's actually not as hard as it seems. So I would encourage anyone who's interested to try to make it happen for themselves. Especially uh, living the dream, the fa- the phrase itself is very subjective and it can really depend on uh, different people and their uh, different perspectives on what they want to do in their lives. So thank you so much, Kayla, for coming to the show, sharing your perspective. It's, as I mentioned earlier, it's really a fresh take on uh, this whole lifestyle and I appreciate you sharing everything with us today. So I really would like to wish you uh, good luck for your book and your journey in the future. (laughs) So thank you so much for having me. It was so nice talking. I hope that, uh, yeah, everyone feels inspired to go book a plane ticket if that's what they want to (laughs) do. I sure am. (laughs) Thanks, you all. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you liked today's episode, don't forget to hit that subscribe button to stay tuned. And follow us on Instagram at allthingsmillennial underscore podcast. If you are tuning in on Apple or Spotify, we would love to get a greeting from you. Until next time, keep dreaming, keep exploring and keep being the amazing millennial that you are. See you in the next episode. Bye.